Let me read to you a passage from the 8th chapter of St Luke's Gospel, verses 4 to 15. It's the Gospel for Saturday of the 24th week in Ordinary Time. St Luke writes, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that, though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. That's from Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 15. What does it suggest to us? Well, it suggests what it means being good soil. We read that, and I quote, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, that Jesus told this parable. Now, let us for a moment think of those crowds. Large numbers were involved, and they were drawn from various parts of the country. Now it is clear that the attitudes and dispositions represented by these people varied enormously. The very parable that our Lord proceeds to narrate implies this. He told the crowds that it was not enough to hear the word of God which they were doing, they must be good soil that retained the word and persevered in it. The implication is plainly that our Lord could see that many were not of this disposition. Thinking of the crowds who were listening to Jesus and coming to him, let us think of the many who were not listening to him nor coming to him. And there must have been many such. You know, just as an aside, I've often wondered about St. Paul prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus. He would have been a younger contemporary of our Lord and of the Twelve and of the disciples who had accompanied him. We read that at Stephen's martyrdom, those who stoned him laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Perhaps Paul was of the same age as John the beloved disciple. Now, was he in Judea at the time of our Lord's public ministry? Was he in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel, his teacher? And had he heard of our Lord at the time of his ministry? I suspect he had, but he makes no mention of it. In my view, this implies that his commitment was wholly to that taught to him by his teachers. At the time, he had not been interested in Jesus of Nazareth. Well, that is mere speculation, but my point is that the undoubtedly mixed disposition of the crowds that sought our Lord, and which is implied in the very parable that we have before us, was characteristic of the nation at large. Herod himself was curious and wanted to see Jesus. There were various views of Jesus of Nazareth and various attitudes towards him. Indeed, this profoundly mixed attitude is characteristic of humanity. Now, I mention all this as a prompt, as an introduction,
for a question we ought to ask ourselves. What is it that is driving my life? Can I pinpoint what my life is based on, as far as can be seen? What is the abiding interest of my life? And what is it that constitutes my ultimate choice? Of course, we cannot be too sure of ourselves. St. Paul writes in one of his letters that his conscience is clear, but he does not place his confidence ultimately in that. He places his confidence in the goodness and mercy of God. Or again, in a letter to an acquaintance towards the end of his long life, Cardinal Newman in the 19th century speaks of the first principles of our thinking. He makes the point that often these first principles or starting points are beyond our direct sight and we need to pray to God that he will give us the right starting points. The right ones. Well, let us reflect on that. Is what my life is based on, is what I'm really committed to, is what is driving the direction of my daily life objectively right and correct? Is the foundation of my life the true foundation? Perhaps, as I have observed, it is too difficult to be absolutely sure of our own hearts, but at least we can stop and take stock of the foundations we are building our house upon. We know what it is that will bear fruit and what it is that will come to nothing. Our Lord speaks plainly and in all simplicity of it in the Gospel passage I read earlier. It is the word of God as it comes from his lips that bears the harvest. He and his revelation must be the bedrock of our lives. And this has to mean a great commitment on our part to hear that word coming from him and for love of him to retain it, hold it, and live by it perseveringly. This is the bedrock for every man and woman, and there are many who do not understand that this is, objectively speaking, the true and sure bedrock. So vast is the range of religious belief and philosophical positions, and so varied the attitudes to Jesus Christ, that many regard objective truth as a, well, as a chimera. It is a phantom, and the truth and that the truth is, well, merely a subjective opinion. All that matters is what seems to work. Well, let those who count themselves as Christ's disciples be very clear about their life's choice. Christ is to be their life. In his parable, our Lord describes in simple and broad strokes the human race in its attitude to him who is the way, the truth and the life. Humanity is like the ground on which the seed falls. Well, let us not be like the patches of ground that yield little or nothing. We must be good ground. And that will only be the case if we are absolutely committed to Christ and his word. And Christ and his word come to us in his body, the church. It is there that he is found. He and his revelation. Let us do all we can to bear witness to this before our often uncertain and harried fellow man. It is the greatest good we can do for our fellow men to help them find the objectively true meaning of life, which is Christ and his word.